your profession at all. So now yeah. it's great to have you back. Yeah, yeah. great to be here. Um, I'm going to unmute this. And um, can everyone hear me? Maybe even too much. I can even turn it off and probably project. But um, OK, yes, that makes sense. So it's super fun to be back here. I was talking to Beth, I think it's been a decade. Um, and some things haven't changed at all, like Dick Smith. <laughs> but some things have really changed, like the whole Fab Lab area is pretty phenomenal. Um, I'm, I'm jealous, actually, because the University of Maryland has nothing like that. Um, so you're, you're lucky uh, to be here. Um, yeah, and I'm also excited to just come back and um, have a chance to share the book and um, talk with you about what I've been working on. And before I start, I'm just curious, because I like to kind of understand the makeup of the audience. So, so what disciplines are represented here? Is this mostly landscape architecture? OK. Anybody from architecture or planning? OK. Oh, good. All right. So I'll, I'll be hybrid. I'll put my hybrid hats on and talk that way. Um, I think lights. Beth did a good job talking about what I, what I was doing when I was here as a student. But for sure, the, the, the book is an extension of the work that I did um, here as a student and also at the Graduate School of Design in Harvard, um, at Harvard. Um, my thesis project there was on forestry. And I had started to look at a lot of case studies as part of the thesis project. Um, and started to observe that there were these both new projects coming on the scene and kind of canonical projects that all were connected to forestry. Um, and what I wanted to do is to study all those projects together um, to kind of get my finger on the pulse of the new buildings that I saw emerging. And so the book is really an extension of the work I was doing to look at other projects during my thesis project, just to kind of decide, OK, I'm doing this design thesis. Now what conversation am I joining? You look at case studies and you say, OK, I'm joining this conversation in architecture. I'm joining this conversation in landscape. And then I kind of realized that there was a little bit of a gap in the conversation and that, that there were certain contemporary buildings that, you know, shared themes but weren't really being described. And so I wanted to write the book as a way of exploring that more because I didn't quite know how to describe it either. Um, and so architecture and the forest aesthetic, a new look at design and resilient urbanism. Um, and I'm super indebted to um, Professor Meyer for writing the foreword, beautiful like touching forward um, for the book and helping me kind of remember how the book is definitely connected back to um, the work I was doing here, but also just this place, this city and the campus as a landscape um, with history, with an amazing um, forested landscape, Observatory Hill, and how that is part of the campus and part of the um, kind of ethos of the university. So like I, I said before, the book, the, the format of the book is really, to put it simply, 21 case study projects um, that define forest aesthetic in the context of a design discipline. So the book, the audience for the book is really design disciplines. Um, and why did I choose the case study format? Because as I was thinking about writing, there were a lot, you know, there are a lot of different ways to approach a book. Um, but for me, as a, as a design scholar, I wanted to spend some time, like I said before, reflecting on the continuum of projects um, and, and, and try to find what the takeaway was, because that was a big question in my mind. What's, what, what's the takeaway for our discipline when we look at you know, all these projects together? The takeaway for me, I only realized after <laughs> writing the book, the takeaway, the true takeaway has emerged, I think, in the past year when I've had some time to reflect on the case studies and also have conversations about the book with folks like you. Um, and what I realized really is the forest aesthetic is a model, a medium, a metaphor for different kinds of carbon cycles involved in urbanization. And I'll try to 
you know, share what I mean by that. But um, I think that has influenced, I, I never really talked about it specifically like that in the book, Carbon Cycles. Um, but I think it's influenced the work that I'm now doing um, on low heat, what I call low heat urbanism or living carbon urbanism. And that is urbanism, so architecture, landscape architecture, regional planning, that is inspired by and focused on carbon cycles and keeping um, carbon out of the atmosphere and using materials that um, are living, right? So if you think about plastic, plastic is not a living material. It's been, you know, it's highly processed. It's not low heat because it's, it, you know, involves a lot of embodied energy, a lot of energy to produce plastic. Um, and, and it's dead, it's not growing or emerging. And so I'm interested in both low heat in terms of low embodied energy and low toxicity, but also living carbon in terms of um, like raw materials, right? Um, and so in the past year, I've um, joined up with the National Center for Smart Growth, they're housed at the University of Maryland. Um, and a local architecture firm, Beckerlin Design, um, they're doing some really, I think, very progressive projects. And we founded the Low Heat Research Collaborative. Um, and we're, we're, we're kicking that off by um, you know, researching low heat materials, trying to develop a palette of those materials, define what they are. One of the first things that we realized is that low heat materials are, are seen often in vernacular projects. Um, and they're often used in very sophisticated ways but that today there is a bit of a stigma connected to low heat materials because they require, they're labor intensive. They do require particular processing um, and they, um, they require maintenance. They break down quickly. They're biodegradable. So there are obstacles, I think, to having low heat urbanism and living carbon urbanism, especially in, in conversations with architects um, because architects, I, I know, I, you're taught to kind of design buildings to be permanent and not to break down. Um, and the idea that you would recycle a building after 20 years or decompose a building after 20 years is not super popular. Um, so part of the work that we're doing is, is trying to advance buildings that can decompose, to think about um, using these vernacular materials in new ways. Um, and the other thing that we're doing is um, trying to connect, trying to connect all the dots by researching contemporary projects that use low heat materials, connecting them back to particular plants, um, how the plants are processed, and also connecting them to how they're used in, vernac in examples of vernacular architecture and vernacular landscape. So we're producing this um, kind of, we call it an ingredient timeline. We like to think about the low heat materials as ingredients. This is actually back to the foraging of plants because the, the foods that I was collecting here in Charlottesville weren't foods that you could just like eat, you know, pick and eat. They had to be really processed um, a certain way in order to be edible. And so um, I think of low heat materials the same way. And on the right here is one of the recipes. It uses a product called Vancor cork and wool as insulation, and tulip poplar bark as exterior skin. And here is a study, a different, um, different foundation studies for historical low heat foundations and also contemporary. So just to give you a sense of where the book went ultimately, and now I'm going to uh, kind of fold this conversation about carbon cycles back into um, the, the book. So I, I don't obviously have time to go through all 21 case studies today, but I want to just give you a taste of some of the projects in the book, and then I'll talk about a couple. Um, so um, how many of you have ever heard of CLT, cross-laminated timber? Yeah, OK. So um, in, in 2009 and 2010, conversations about CLT were like, we're just starting on the periphery um, because of the first CLT supply scraper, which was built in London 
Um, and Murray Grove is the name of the project. It's six stories tall. It's a multifamily apartment building entirely constructed in wood, except for the foundation. And um, it was designed by Waugh Thistleton Architects, and it was a really progressive project for the time because the building codes at that time did not allow multifamily residential buildings to be built in wood. And so they really had to push that CLT, or cross-laminated timber um, panels, really functioned like heavy timber. And they got the building codes changed. And in 2014, the building codes in the United States changed to allow uh, mass timber or cross-laminated timber. And so I noticed in 2014 this huge kind of explosion of CLT projects. So that was one of the, the currents that I noticed. And I like to think about mass timber buildings as buildings that hold or sequester carbon. Another um, project that came on the scene around 2014 um, was Bosco Verticale. And ha has anyone heard of this project before? You kind of see it in like ArchiZoom or you know the, the designer websites. But it's the really the first skyscraper wrapped in trees. And architects have been drawing skyscrapers wrapped in trees for many, many, many years. But Boeri Studio really were the first architects that convinced a developer to build a skyscraper and give away that real estate to a forest. Um, and so I, I call this a living carbon project. In the book, I, I do critique the project, but it was this project I was seeing all over the place. And it was kind of, a, you know, I wanted to be able to talk about it more, um, both in terms of the critique, but also what I think is good about the project. Um, this is a, a historic case study project that um, you might recognize this plan on the right. Canberra um, is the capital city of Australia. This is the winning proposal for the plan designed by architects um, Walter and Marion Mahoney Griffin. And the city is often referred to as the garden city. And so I knew it from my history survey classes. But I also started digging and kind of found the telling of the story of the city through the eyes of a horticulturalist. And it was fascinating to read that history and see that actually this is I call it an example of landscape-based urbanism because the foundation of the city is, is trees. The trees were used as survey pegs. And for the first 20 years, it was just trees. There were no other infrastructures. And the reason for that was that the, 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 um, the plains where the city was going to be built were denuded um, because of agriculture and it's severely windy. And so they had to put in place these tree breaks and buffers to make the city habitable. So the, the horticulturists started you know, surveying the city and planting these trees way before any of the architecture or anything else was built. And so there's a, a really beautiful story there that's different than the Garden City story. It's a story of carbon or trees as, as an infrastructure for the city. Um, this is a, a beautiful little garden that uses charred wood um, in the boreal forest in Canada. This is a project called Future Library. It's a wooden library that holds 100 never-read stories. It's, it's this beautiful project in, in Norway. It's a project that will last 100 years. Um, and I call this sharing carbon or handing over carbon over 100 years. Um, another case study in the book is a, a, an installation project that I worked on that I call forest as a forum or a collective space um, or creative carbon. Um, and then you know, another example case study project is Harvard Forest. It's a wired forest. Um, and I talk about this project really as like understanding carbon or studying carbon. So those are a few of the case studies that I won't talk about today, but I wanted to give you a sense that the, the forest aesthetic and the, the projects in the book range from architecture, landscape architecture, you know, cities, regional plans, to small installations. Um, they're, they're also from all over the world, but um, one of the things that I realized when I was doing the research and had to kind of post-rationalize is that 
they all fit within a, a particular global biome. This is something I had not anticipated. I just looked for the projects, placed them on a global map, and then realized that they all fall within the temperate forest biome, which you can see in gray. The tip of South America, the tip of Australia, Europe, oops, sorry, um, Europe and um, North America. And that was super, that was super exciting to me, something I hadn't anticipated. And I had, I was getting nervous about describing the forest aesthetic because I knew like CLT buildings wouldn't do well in a place like Florida where it's wet and moldy. They would, you know, they, they wouldn't survive. And I didn't know how to talk about that until I did this map. And then I realized the forest aesthetic applies to a particular biome. So um, I'll talk really briefly about the drawings in the book because I've produced all original drawings um, for the book. Briefly kind of the theory and then I'll share a couple case studies. So um, I wanted to be really intentional about the drawings, both for myself as a way of doing research. Writing for me, I don't know if any of you feel this way, but writing for me is pretty excruciating. Um, and drawing as research tends to be more fluid. And so before I did any writing, I drew all these projects. But I was also, I've also been teaching and wanted to be able to use the projects as teaching tools and talk to students about how you can look at projects and draw them to understand them. And so from the beginning, I was intentional about doing drawings. And one type of drawing I call the active drawing. So there are two examples here on the right is the table in Rome exhibit, um, a plan view that shows how the exhibit changed over time. So the, the guests to the exhibit were allowed to move it um, and the, the pieces of it and that process was recorded by the research assistants I was working with. And the tracks, the floor was wood so there were muddy tracks on the ground and we were starting to record that. And so the drawing on the right is really the performance of the space, what's happening as it's being used. And the drawing on the left is of Harvard Forest, trying to talk about something that is actually invisible when you go to see the forest, but it's the major part of how the forest functions. The forest is part of a huge global network of sites that are actively studying forests over long periods of time, and so data is being passed constantly between these sites across the world. And so this, this map shows those Wi-Fi towers and the data that's, that's going out into the world. Another kind of drawing, and I, I want to show you this because a lot of, almost every day my students ask me, like, how do you represent landscape? How do you draw landscape? Is it figure ground? Is it something else? Um, so I think the act of drawing is helpful for trying to talk about landscapes in flux, but also I think it's really important to understand that landscape is a mosaic, especially the forest is a mosaic. And so many of the drawings are, are patch drawings. Um, so Richard Foreman is a landscape ecologist who um, talks about particular terms that define ecology patch, matrix, um, flow, corridor, so stream corridor. And what I tried to do is really think about the forest as patches um, and also try to understand when one patch meets the next, what kind of mosaic it creates. So on the left is this really beautiful drawing um, by Bruce Winterhalder, um, which, which I think shows the idea of patch. It's actually of the boreal forest, and it shows the form of all of the different burns over time. Um, at a, a zoomed-in scale, I think understanding patch, but also um, like the, the texture and the grain of landscape when you zoom in, that there are, you know, light is being transmitted in different ways. Um, so on the right is a plan of a park from the city of Canberra, noting that you know, the, the um, dense canopies are kind of clustered around this stream of water that goes through the middle of the park. And then the light canopies that allow lots of dappled sunlight to come through are, you know, fill in the rest. And this is a section drawing of Bosco Verticale um, that shows all of the sears or all of the sections 
of the forest, the, the ground cover, the shrubs, the understory, the, even the canopy, there are some canopy trees, and what, you know, what is the texture and grain and light transmission that moves across the section. I do think the figure ground is still a really important drawing for landscape architects to use. And so um, I, I think the figure ground is almost like a, an icon or a silhouette. If you draw it, you get this really quick image of the structure of the landscape, right? Just like if you see a silhouette of a, a person's face, it's, it's like limited information, but it gives you this quick view. And so here are two examples of figure grounds. Um, global drawing, so this is the Harvard Forest Network, Wi-Fi network. Um, uh, biome drawings, zoomed in regional plan drawings, and then city drawings and sort of site plans at the scale of a building block. So those are the, the kinds of drawings that I used for the, um, to do the research. I'd say, it, in a nutshell, the foundational theories um, kind of drew from three different places. I was looking a lot at Stan Allen, um, architect in, uh, at Princeton, um, looking, who has looked at the forest form as an urban, as an inspiration for urban framework. Um, in his writing in Field Conditions, um, he talks about um, urbanism as a mat, as like a thick 2D, um, and uses the term mat urbanism. And so I tried to pick up on that and, and talk about the mat forest and the, the 2D section of the forest as an urban scaled construct or an urban framework. Um, Ian McCarg is an, was an ecological planner coming out of the University of Pennsylvania who talks about, talks about evolution or, or living um, as creative fitting. And I, I don't think of McCarg really as a designer. He was definitely more of an ecologist and a planner, but he does talk about creativity and so that's inter that was interesting to me to think about evolution and, and designing environments where you can survive as a form of creativity. And one of the arguments in the book is that the forest is essential to our survival. It's not just nice and good and, and lovely and good for you know, mental health, but it's essential. We live and we breathe with the forest. Um, and then this woman who some of you may know, <laughs> Elizabeth Meyer, <laughs> amazing thinker, landscape architect, theorist, um, who really inspired me, obviously both as a student um, and you know she was a, a mentor of mine and I love her essay, um, Sustaining Beauty, where she talks about the performance of beauty. And I also have had a great time kind of like tracing that conversation from the original essay and seeing how Professor Meyer has evolved that over time, evolved her thinking, engaged in more conversations. And in the end, that inspired me to take a little bit of a chance with the book, where I argued that the forest is essential because it produces oxygen that we breathe and it tempers climate, but it's also essential because of its beauty. It's, it's essential because we take it to heart. We care about it. Um, and so that was one of the theories in the book as well. So 21 case studies. Um, the, other, the other way I tried to structure the case studies and think about them all together was to, to think about each case study as representing a design tactic. So this is one of the things I talk to my students about a lot when they're doing design projects in studio and they're looking at case studies and they're analyzing it. And then it's like, what's the takeaway? What's the so what? And I think the best thing to do is to say, okay, here's a design tactic from the case study. Here, here's this phenomenon, here's this thing happening. You know, it doesn't necessarily translate directly to the project or the site that I'm working on, but it's, a, it's an interesting design tactic and I wanna try it out. And so what I tried to do with these projects is identify what the design tactics were and think about them as something that um, that they're translatable, right? They can be used on any project, these tactics. So there are primary chapters and those are represented by the design tactics that, that are in bold. And then there are supplemental, supplemental um, short chapters. 
but there's the list of the design tactics. Um, today, I'll, I'll talk really briefly about three projects. Um, the book is structured, the first part of the book is about the material of the forest. So obviously thinking about wood, but other materials like um, f fungi and decomposition or um, burned materials from the boreal forest. The second part of the book talks about the forest as, a, as collective space. So the forest as a, a public space, as an urban space. Um, and then the last part of the book is a little bit more projective, looking at the, you know, what, what the forest tells us about maybe about our future. Did you have a, oh no, you didn't have a question. Um, okay, so the first project from the built-in wood section is called the Design Make Forest. Um, and it's, like I said, part of, part of um, under the heading of um, projects built in wood. This is an example of a CLT project. Um, the Design Make Forest is, is Hook Park, which is the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London's woodland campus in the UK. It's an ancient semi-natural woodland. Um, the, the Hook Park has been around for a long time. It has a history beyond the School of Architecture. It was a parish in 1810. You see on the left the parish map. It was an estate in the 1900s. But one thing that I noticed when I looked at these, the historical maps and when I also started studying the School of Architecture is that, um, and you can see it in this detail, is that the act of coppicing has always been present on this site. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the term coppicing, if you've talked about that yet. Yeah, what, what's your understanding? People have different understandings of the term. Not, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so it's it's cutting off the, the main stem so that lots of new shoots come up. And you can see there's woodland coppice, shepherd coppice, lamper gate coppice. But coppice wood was used in many different ways by the parish and also on the estate, and now today by the school. And so on the right is a map of the school, and you can see the different there are different forests with different plantings represented by the, you know, the, the different textures, the density and the sort of gridded or random form of the textures. And then there are clusters of buildings. But the focus for the study on this um, site is small diameter round wood and fresh and green wood. In other words, coppice, which you can see here on the left. Um, and um, so this is, you know, so the students are, are experiment with coppice. It has no value in the UK right now because standard lumber two by fours has kind of taken over the construction industry and the coppice wood isn't really used the way that it used to be used to create living fences or for basket weaving or for fodder for animals. Um, and so the school is trying to come up with new uses and new ways to value coppice. Um, this is, this is a small diameter round wood used in the wood chip barn, and you can see it requires some intense structural engineering. Um, this is the wood chip barn from the outside. All of the buildings on campus are built with coppice wood, and they all take on different forms. But the students study these pieces of wood like intensely. They use digital tools. Um, for understanding the range of bending, where the, you know, where the structural um, force is, where the strength is. And so here are some examples of a student's drawing as he's studying the, the structure of coppice and the structure actually of a, of a piece of coppice wood that forms a V. And so this is a, um, a workshop building called the Big Shed. You can see the scantlings also are these small diameter round woods. Scantlings come from when they thin the forest. They have these sort of irregular pieces of wood that aren't straight that they thin out. Um, and so they use those to construct buildings. And to me, the, the really beautiful, I mean, not only are they trying to create a new economy for round wood, but 
for me, the, the beautiful piece here is that by, by joining these round wood pieces together, by understanding their complexity, what they're doing is coming up with architecture that almost directly translates the structural logic of the forest, right? So if you were an architect designing a building, I'm not sure you'd come up with that form, right? Like it would be really hard to start drawing that and have a reason for drawing it. But they start with the structural logics of the forest, of the round wood. They, they piece it together and that's what they end up with. And to me, seeing that building against the forest um, it is, is a really beautiful translation, right? It's architecture that's a beautiful translation of the structure of the forest. Um, so that's the, the first project. Second project I call water logging. I just have a few slides for this project, but it's one of my favorite projects. Um, it's part of the, the tree infrastructure um, portion of the, the book um, where trees are described as green infrastructure for the city city making. Um, water logging is the design tactic that I um, use to describe Boss Park in Amsterdam. Um, I know, I, I think all of, many of you are in Professor Meyer's theory class and maybe have read Anita Beretz-Betia's essay on, on Boss Park, which is a beautiful essay, which I had read as a student um, and was fascinated by and went back to as I looked at this project. Um, so you can see here in the Netherlands, you know, it's 14 meters below sea level. So for me, that was an interesting case study in and of itself because in the context of climate change, we're thinking about sea level rising. Um, and this area in red is the area of, of the Boss Park. And before it was Boss Park, as you may know it, it was a polder. And, um, Holders are, are basically canals or ditches um, that are created to, to make agricultural land. And the important thing is that they have to be drained constantly, right? And so the form of the, the polder is really a representation of the civil engineering that's required to create land in the Netherlands. And the Boss Park and, and Barrett's Betia argues is, is actually a really, it's a foreign design language it's the design language that, that came about as part of a, a trend of um, like folks, folk parks or people's parks in Europe as, as kind of part of a, a modern movement of, of public works. Um, and so when you look at it, 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 it doesn't seem distinctly Dutch. And she actually talks about it that way. Um, but, and, and this series of section diagrams um, is from a drawing from the original, um, the original Bosch plan. And it shows how to construct the park, um, trees were sunk into the ground and then there was some dramatic engineering that took place. And I thought it was interesting to see that to construct the park, it was sinking trees into the ground and then engineering the water. That's what it was. And I realized that in Amsterdam, all of the buildings were constructed the same way, right? So we're looking at a park that seems really foreign, but then when you dig deeper, it's constructed exactly the same way that all of the buildings in old Amsterdam are constructed. And here you see the buildings in old Amsterdam use submerged logs or trees into the ground under, under the water um, and then carefully engineer the water levels. So with the buildings, the water levels have to be engineered so that the logs stay completely submerged, otherwise they decay. With the forest, the water levels have to be lower so that the roots of the trees don't drown. But it's still the same thing. It's using Danford canals to, to even out the water level through the season. And so here you see um, an 18th century drawing of hand um, driving a wood pile down into the ground. And here you see steam piler. And these are how the buildings were constructed. And then 1936, the same thing, the, you know, the public works building the forest by driving trees down into the ground. So it's that same water logging process. Um, this, and I, I think this um, 
kind of like advertisement for the park opening is also really cool to see that you know you, you actually see the construction technique for the park and you see who constructed it right <laughs> just regular people constructed it um, this project is also special to me um, because this is my my father's family at the park and I think these drawings are wonderful because you can see the so the the succession the first trees that were planted were meant to kind of drain the soil so the willow and poplar and elder were planted um, and that's what you see here and then once the soil is drained a bit the um, the old growth trees the beech and the maple and the oak come up and create the full canopy and today it's a you know full canopy huge old growth tree forest but this is um, I think a great historic view that shows the process in between um, and so going back to water logging as a construction technique for what I describe a, a particularly Dutch construction technique for um, designing and making public space for ordinary people, a, a public park for ordinary people, where ordinary people would feel at home. The last project um, from the last section of the book I call the Vertical Forest Biosystem. And um, this is the Bosco Verticale project, which I talked about earlier. It's on the cover of the book. Um, built in 2014, two skyscrapers wrapped in a forest. And I, I really critique this project. Like, I, I have a lot of problems with it. But um, I also think there are some things that are worthy to talk about. The thing that I like most about this project is that the forest skyscrapers were never meant to just be these two separate totems. They were always seen by Boeri Studio as part of a larger plan called Bio Milano, which was a plan for a new biological city. So the, the vertical forest biosystem, which is the term I use for that skyscraper, <laughs> vertical forest, that biosystem was just one of the pieces, you can see it here, that was just one of the pieces of this much larger human forest biome. And Boeri Studio was trying to, to rethink and rebrand the city of Milan as a human forest biome. And they had lots of different kinds of projects. So these are some example projects. They were looking at the, the metro forest as well. So the, the vertical forest skyscrapers also, so this is where the two Bosco Verticale towers are. The vertical forest skyscrapers, their vision was for these towers to be um, totems and markers that were connected to metro stops and that could be part of the branding or the vision or the new silhouette for the city and so it was you know there are two here but they had envisioned them all throughout the city as part of the public green space and so it, in my mind that's a really different vision for wood urbanism the urbanism of the forest, really, really different than this image from Chicago. So I'm going to flip back here. These projects here were called um, wood houses. So you have the Bosco Verticale forest skyscrapers as these totems, but then you also have the production of CLT happening in the city. So it's a, a kind of wood industry and wood urbanism. And here you see how, what that, wood urbanism looks like, right? So industry is right next to housing. And those two uses are compatible, right? So that really blows our idea of zoning codes, sorry, and zoning out of the water. Right now, industry and housing are not compatible uses, but in this, in this image, they are. Um, and that, like I said before, is super different than this wood urbanism from um, the 18, you know, late 1800s. This shows the Chicago Lumber District, which is it's really a monoculture. And it's not a place where you can have housing or you know, public space or the kind of urbanism quality of life that you see here. Um, 
so this, this larger Biomilano plan. And then um, there were other ideas that the, the tower's hydrology, you know, the forest would have this hy hydrological system so that things like gray water from the apartment buildings would be recycled and used as irrigation. Um, and, and this is a drawing that you know, showed that. And they haven't gotten to that point yet. I think it was, it was a goal. And I think in order to justify a project like this, it would have to, you know, you'd absolutely have to use the gray water to irrigate the trees. Um, I will say, like, right now, the trees are intensive care patients. They require a ton of maintenance, and I, I don't think that's sustainable. What Boeri said was he wasn't actually interested that much in sustainability. He was interested in diversity. So um, I don't have the diagram here, but what, what he shows is that the, the quality, he was creating a new quality of life where humans share their apartment with other species. And so on this biodiversity drawing that he created, you have the different species of trees, but the other species include like ticks, mosquitoes, rats, <laughs> songbirds, <laughs> you know, uh, ladybugs, ladybird beetles, right? But the idea is that it's a test. This is what I like the most about this project. It's a test to see if humans are comfortable sharing the city, sharing the vertical surface with other species, right? Are humans going to freak out when a branch like falls off? Are they going to get really nervous about that? Or are they going to trust the flying gardeners who are rock climbers and gardeners that fly up on the building once a month and, and trim the trees? Are they going to trust that and feel comfortable with it? Are they going to be OK with mosquitoes and ticks and cockroaches and maybe rats, right, as species that exist in their garden? Um, so this is an image from another project drawn by Bowery Studio, but it shows the messiness of the vertical surface that he envisioned, the biological surface, the biosystem. This is really where the project ended up, and it's kind of been like sterilized, right? So I, my, one of my critiques, too, is that the, the in order to get the project built, it, it, it moved away from this image of kind of messiness and heterogeneity to this more cleaned up image. Um, and I have two more slides. I, this is another case study from the book, actually a project built um, in 1976 in Milan by an architect um, named Frederick Hundervasser. It's, he calls these trees, trees, tree tenants. And he argues that he argued the same thing that Boeri argued, that humans should share their real estate with other species, right? And that, that that's a good thing. And the interesting thing is Hunterwasser on his plans identified species that are, are on the invasive species list, right? Like um, Ilanthus, which will grow in a centimeter of soil, you know, on a windowsill because it's it's pre-adapted to grow well in mountain landscapes, you know, really extreme landscapes. Whereas Boeri Studio, the botanist took like 10 years to wind test all sorts of different species and create these hybrids, and now they're treating them like intensive care patients, right? So I think the argument here is for, for these to be viable, the palette, the plant palette has to be different, right? We have to rethink what we think is beautiful in terms of the, the plant palette and, and come up with species that actually are pretty easy to maintain and will take care of themselves. And, and those species might be invasive species, right? We, species that we consider weeds, but that in this chapter about Hunterwasser, I call spontaneous ornament, spontaneous plants that actually grow up on their own and, and, and take care of themselves. So the last image here is a, a silhouette of the city. And this, I think, you know, just, just circling back to the performance of how something looks, I think this profile for a skyscraper is very unique, right? Seeing a, a furry skyscraper is really different. And, and these two towers, this is the view you see right when you come out of the main metro at Porta Nuova. That's the new brand for the neighborhood. 
And it's given people permission, if you look at the apartment buildings next to the tower, it's given other people permission to be a little messy with their vegetation, right? To like let the ivy grow over, let the you know ivy grow on the walls. And, and that, I think, is powerful, right? To me, that is this new vision of the biological city starting to happen. And it's, it's really an aesthetic, right? It's really changing, um, changing how something looks in order to change the ethos or the attitude. That's it. So yeah, we can open it up for, this is always my favorite part of these book talks. I'm trying not to go on too long to leave some time for a conversation, but um, curious to hear ideas, thoughts, connections to what you're working on in studio or other courses. How many of you are in the, the studio with Beth and Sarah and Michael? Okay. So I know a little bit about that project. The urban frame, first you designed this, the small piece, right? And now you're on the urban framework. And moving. And moving. And, and moving back to the small piece. Yeah. Yeah, whenever there's a lot of students are thinking about questions, can you even talk about the process that you started with? Of, um, um, yeah. If, if you could talk about the process of reflecting on the book after you finished the book. Yeah. Yeah. What, like what, what prompted that? What kind of questions? Who were you talking to? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm asking that because um, it's easy to think of a book as a thing. It's done. On to the next thing. But you were describing an arc of inquiry that had continuity. Right. And it might be interesting to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the things that prompted it was I, I gave the book talk and um, my my colleague who has started the Low Heat Collaborative was in the audience that day and came up to me afterwards and, and kind of challenged me on the first section of the book, which was the built-in wood. And he's an architect and he said like, okay, so let's talk, CLT, we know what that is. Like, let's, let's be more progressive, right? And he said, I, I just built this building out of BAMCOR, which is, um, it's like bamboo crushed. I don't know if any of you have heard it. It's like a hollow core panel um, that flattens bamboo, but doesn't require a lot of adhesive. And it keeps the structural integrity of the, the bamboo in place. And then you can stuff it with any kind of insulation. And so he said, like, CLT holds carbon, but, you know, we had a little bit of an argument about whether it's toxic or, you know, whether it really is sustainable. So I think part of it was just talking about the book and then meeting other people who came to challenge me on it. He was really interested in the conversation about decomposition. Um, there's a chapter in the book called Mycelium Bricks, which are bricks that w are built out of mushrooms, mushrooms that are grown and then cured, um, and they can be decomposed. And he was experimenting with mycelium in a, in a couple of his buildings. So that, that was part of it. Um, but I was also, you know, in the last year teaching a studio with regional planners. And here's, I think, here's why I'm so glad to be like a cross-disciplinary person. Um, so I'm teaching in the architecture program. I have a degree in landscape architecture. I can talk to an architect about landscape architecture, but I can also teach a regional planning studio where we're talking about how things that are outside of a designer's control, like fuel prices, whether autonomous vehicles are going to be successful and developed um, or not, or whether, you know, who's going to be elected president. So, you know, what policy is going to, are we going to have lots of good policy? Or are we going to have like little government? We were teaching a studio and trying to come up with scenarios for the regional plan for DC based on these these things that might shift. And so we had four scenarios where one was fuel prices high, one was fuel prices low. And so I was thinking about um, 
I was thinking a lot about carbon in the atmosphere because I realized like there are these forces that are so much bigger than the design world that we don't have control over and 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 actually I got a little scared thinking about it thinking about how much carbon is going to be in the atmosphere in a metro area like DC um, and realizing that something has to be done to deal with the carbon in the atmosphere and change urbanization so it was it was the conversations I think and mostly pushback like I think about your article on sustaining beauty and how it sparked so much conversation, right? And people, you know, pushed back and people agreed and then you were able to come back and like refine the idea over time. And it's been one of the best conversations in the discipline because of that. Um, and so for me in a really small way, not as public of a way, but you know, writing the book allowed new conversations to, to start um, and then inspired me to like do the next round, right? Like low heat, I should have written about that in my book, you know? So that kind of answered your question. It's a little bit, little bit of a tangent, but I, I think it was, I think it's the conversations that the dialogue that comes out of it. Mm -hmm. I'm currently working for a studio on a project in Jaipur. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I'm proposing is putting a, a productive nursery right on the edge of the city. Mm -hmm. It's both a buffer between the hills and the edge of the city, but it's also a source of income. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm um, finding difficulties with is if it is a productive space, how does it not become something that excludes people who might use it differently than as a productive space. Right. And so I'm wondering if you have examples of spaces like that that are hybrids. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's a great question. And I'm, I, when you first started talking about it, the, Can the Canberra case study popped into my mind immediately. And I don't know if you're familiar with the history of that city at all. But um, the, the first public space was the nursery. And the, the horticulturalist, they actually told him to put the nursery kind of in the periphery at the foot of the mountains. And he insisted that the nursery be right on like the Capitol Hill, <laughs> right in the center of the city, because he wanted to keep an eye on things. But he also wanted it to be like the hangout spot where everyone would come. And so um, I think it would be good to look at that case study and how there are historic images of that nursery and how it's set up. He was, he was, one of the things was he was giving out trees and also like advice to homeowners for free. And, um, you know, it was part of how the nursery got funded. Not sure what policy was set up to create that, but people understood it as a place to go to get free things, but also to hang out um, because there was a, you know, it was in the center of the city. So, I think the, I think you're talking about your nursery more as a kind of periphery, but if you can, you can still have a center on the edge, right? If you can make it a place that seems, that feels porous, I think you'll allow all sorts of different uses. So it could be a nursery, but it could, you know, you, you could think about how you create the edge and whether the edge is closed off or whether the edge has a kind of gate or an entryway, whether the edge is actually the pub most public space where people are having lunch or hanging out or doing you know, educational programs or even, you know, I've seen some urban agriculture projects where they, they like show videos and do movie screenings because it's a piece of land that can have layered uses. Um, so it might be interesting to do a diagram where you talk about the choreography of the uses. And so it's like, okay, there's the nursery, but then what other kinds of uses can happen on top of that? Can it be movie night? Can it be chef classes? Can it be you know, free gardening advice? Can it be Virginia Tech's extension service, right? or Jaipur's extension service. So yeah, I think making making it a center. 
but Canberra is a great precedent, I think, for that, the nursery there. Okay, um, this is quite specific just to the, one of the first slides you showed, you had um, uh, kind of a cross section of materials for, for a wall. Um, and it was like cotton um, and different wood types. Yeah, um, I'm getting there, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> too many that, slides. Uh, we Here we go, yeah. yeah. Um, uh -huh. I, I, I don't know, it's, it's just out of my curiosity. Um, are, how are these held together, and has this been implemented in a project, and is this part of a biodegradable house yeah. or something? Yeah, so, it, so yes. Um, it's put together, so this is just like a little chunk of a bigger wall section. So Bancor comes as panels, like four by eight panels, almost like plywood, and it's put together with screws. Um, like there's one, the this, um, Beckerlin Design has designed and built a project called the Grass House with Bancor, and they use one kind of mechanical fastener. So you basically put up these four by eight panels, um, and they structurally support themselves. So you me mechanically fasten them to each other, and then you secure them to the foundation. The foundation of a building is a hollow core block foundation. So it's a lot like a SIP panel. I don't know if you've heard of a structural insulated panel where it's like, it's structural and it's self-supporting, it, um, but it's made out of much more sustainable materials. Um, BAMCOR is biodegradable. What they did, um, so, so BAMCOR, you, it comes, it's, it's a hollow panel. The inside of the panel is actually Douglas fir. The outside of the panel is bamboo and then you put an exterior finished material on top of it. The project that they built has charred wood as the exterior finished material. So they have the BAM core, they have furring strips to create like an airspace, and then charred wood, which the charring is like burning and that's naturally weather and insect resistant. Um, and so it functions like a rain screen. And then in this example, it's cork and, and poplar and they're building a project with this right now. So um, in terms of it being biodegradable, there's the, the construction details mean that the, the building will last for a long time, as, as long as any like stick built two by four building would last. But if it does start molding, the panels, the BAMCOR panels can be taken down easily because there's one fastener. There's not like a ton of nails and things. There's one fastener. So you can take them down and, and replace them, or you can just replace the siding. So it's, I guess you would call it like pretty modular in that way. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's, the, the house smells so good. It's a, it's a wonderful <laughs> smell. Like you can tell when you go in there that you, you don't smell that typical paint or drywall smell. It, it has a different smell. It, like it's definitely a, a a natural smell, you know, but it's beautiful. That smell always tells me it's biodegradable or like I could probably eat it and still be okay, you know? <laughs> um, anyway, did you have one more question or was that, yeah? Yeah, actually, I have one more question. Mm -hmm. I think I guessed the last one, but um, so the question I had was about the temporality of this building. Um, it was it was being measured over the last 20 years. From what I've heard that the typical Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah. why are we so nervous about a building that might be controlled? Like exactly. I mean, and I, I think the problem, this is happening in D.C., and it's scary, is like these buildings are built, and they're, they're only supposed to last 20 years, but then we live in them for like 50, 60, 70 years, and they're just, the wall cavities are full of mold. Like they're never, they're made with materials that aren't, you know, they're like toothpicks. They're made with materials and insulation that don't last. So fiberglass insulation 
where, you know, DC housing, there's a crisis because of the, um, the mold and moisture problems and the buildings have to be, they're torn down, but they're not, that's the thing. They're around for like 50 years. So there's a denial, I think. We're using building materials that don't last, but then we're like, we're in denial about it. And um, I, I think that the skin around the walls is a little bit more permanent, right? Like we use aluminum siding, and so it kind of looks like it's staying together, <laughs> but it's not. Um, and I think that when you have, when you, when you use a material like this, it's, it's much clearer when it starts to break down, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think one of, obviously one of the issues is the cost of labor and cost of materials. And I think that what the Lohi Collaborative is trying to do is to make these materials more accessible and cheaper. Um, you know, make them like products you can buy at Lowe's. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know why we're still hung up on this idea of permanence, because again and again we see like that we just do like little band-aid repairs, but really the building probably should be taken down. I mean, I've worked on so many projects where it's like, I'm working with Children's Hospital right now. They just bought a huge site in Prince George's County. It's a retreat center. And there were 10 cabins and a dining hall, and they were gonna have their first summer camp there. And then they realized like it's, the buildings were built in a wetland and they're all molding. They're all like two by four with aluminum siding and they just have to take them all down, right? And they're 20 years old. So I think that happens a lot, but it's not really part of the disciplinary conversation, the, the temporality. Um, I think there's still some denial in the way. Yeah. Yeah, the scantlings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I like two things about the question you just asked. I think I like that you mentioned the local food movement because I, I feel like, you know, everybody's on to the idea of local food or organic food. We put it in our bodies. Like, we're getting there when it comes to clothing that we wear. We're starting to wear, like, organic, you know, got certified clothing. And I think the next step is, like, the houses we live in. We're not really aware that the buildings and the houses we live in are, are super toxic you know, not only to make, but also to breathe and live in. So I, I, I love the idea of like the local building being an extension of what I think is a pretty powerful movement um, in food, but also in clothing and in products that we use, furniture. Um, and in the Low Heat Collaborative, we talk about like farm to building, you know, farm to table, farm to building. Um, and yes, there is a conversation for sure with Hook Park the, the um, ply scraper buildings um, designed by Wah Thistleton in London, they published a book about that building where they do like really great carbon studies that show they had to ship the, um, the CLT panels from Austria at the time because that was the only place that produced CLT panels. But they, they did a very careful study of how much carbon um, you know, would be put into the atmosphere because of the fuel costs, and then that was offset by the carbon sequestered by the building. So they break it down, I think, in a really helpful way. Um, I talk about it a little bit in the case study chapter. I added some of the metrics and referenced um, that text. That's one of the best conversations I've seen um, about, like, what it means to be local and, and what the what the life cycle analysis is. So another place if you're interested in looking more into that is to look at some of these, like you just Google life cycle assessment or life cycle analysis and you'll get some pretty good scientific articles that talk about um, you know, the cradle to grave and what the fuel costs are and what, what that is in a project and, and, and how it can be minimized. 
So it definitely is one of the, um, it's one of the conversations, and I think it's one of the most exciting conversations too, because like in this area, we're starting to realize there are, there's this historic use of, um, of quartz and mica for like floor material and for windows, and it's, it's this area is very rich. Um, mining, sometimes mining that material is really high embodied energy, but you can find the waste mica and that can be used um, for like gravel floors, even on the inside. And so there are some historic buildings in this area where you see mica floors. It's like loose mica. It's just like beautiful architecture, you know. Um, the, the tulip poplar bark is also another indigenous material here. And there are some historic buildings that it's chestnut, actually chestnut bark. So the amazing thing is like these structures that are 100 years old, these buildings, are the only place where you can see mature chestnut bark because of the blight. They're, they're preserved on these buildings, which is so cool, right? Like you can't go in any forest and see chestnut like that anymore, but you can go see a building. But the, the tulip poplar, I think, is, you know, is all over the place. It's a weed tree, and it's being used more and more in this area in particular as an exterior siding. Um, with BAMCOR, the BAMCOR is actually trying to establish, right now they get the bamboo from China. They're trying to grow and establish nurseries on the East Coast. So that's happening right now for that very reason, right, the shipping. Yeah, it's a good question. Great, thanks, that was fun. Yes. <laughs>